This is the CBS Evening News. Susan Spencer reporting. Good evening. It was no go again today on Eastern Airlines. The machinist strike virtually shutting down the carrier for the second day in a row as pilots honored the machinist picket lines. By late afternoon, only 56 flights had taken off, and though the company said that would rise to 100 by the end of the day, it also conceded that the strike threatens Eastern's very existence. Peter Van Sant has more. We're going to send a message across this country they haven't seen in a lot of years. For the second straight day, striking machinists and pilots at Eastern Airlines forced the cancellation of hundreds of flights, turning airports into waiting rooms of frustration and tarmacs into aircraft parking lots. Utter chaos. Utter chaos. Right now, the airline is, is a total shambles. They can't, they can't operate with the people they got. Tomorrow, the machinists will go on the offensive, setting up roving picket lines at commuter railroads across the Northeast, a risky tactic which could disrupt and anger hundreds of thousands of passengers. There's a lot of activity that's scheduled. You know, we're not at liberty to disclose that right now. And I think corporate America is going to be uh, showing up. Well, let me say this. We're going to have an eye opener tomorrow morning. A major disruption could turn public opinion against the machinists and force the government to pass emergency laws banning the secondary strikes. I have begged, begged the unions to let this dispute go forward and stay out of secondary picketing. The president and I hope that's what will happen. If it doesn't, however, a lot of people, innocent people, are going to be inconvenienced. This morning, Eastern shifted the blame for all the travel misery onto the pilots who have refused to cross picket lines. By continuing to stay out, the pilots are committing economic suicide. They're risking their careers and the careers of all Eastern men and women. The company is the one that has created this situation. If anyone's creating suicide, it is Frank Lorenzo. Go for Easter! Go for Easter! Caught in between labor and management are thousands of passengers just trying to find a way home. I think it's a lousy thing to happen to, to, to people that uh, have to go places. It kind of irks me and it also uh, is frustrating that they won't uh, try to get us on another airline. Workers! Workers! United! United! Will never be defeated! Jesse Jackson continued his support of the strikers, endorsing their plans to disrupt transportation nationwide. Tonight, President Bush is meeting with Transportation Secretary Skinner for an update on the walkout. Sources say Mr. Bush still plans not to intervene in the strike unless a national transportation emergency arises. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. Late today, a federal judge in New York did impose a restraining order to stop the machinists from picketing commuter railroads. However, it was not at all certain that that order will be obeyed. Experts at the World Ozone Conference in London said today it will take centuries for holes in the Earth's protective ozone layer to close, even if ozone-destroying chemicals are banned. Tom Fenton reports that the international pressure is on to do at least that much. Spring is a little early in England this year. After the warmest winter since the 17th century, the British are talking about the greenhouse effect. At an international conference that opened in London today, the talk is of banning man-made chemicals known as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. It's vital to our own interest, because if we don't work together on these problems, uh, we're all at risk for what happens. CFCs not only contribute to the greenhouse effect, they're rapidly destroying the ozone layer, which is the Earth's natural filter against harmful sun rays that can cause skin cancer and crop damage. Britain's Prime Minister Thatcher invited more than 120 nations to this conference. Her aim is to persuade the developing countries to join the leading industrial nations which have now agreed to phase out CFCs by the end of the century. Just because we made a mistake doesn't mean they have to repeat the same mistake. We should help them leapfrog the age of chlorofluorocarbons and get the technology they need to use the substitutes. CFCs are used everywhere these days. They're the coolant in refrigerators. They're even in the lining in refrigerator walls. Replacements will have to be found. The easiest CFCs to replace will be the gas in aerosol sprays. In Britain, by the end of this year, 9 out of 10 aerosols will be ozone-friendly. Chemical giants such as Britain's ICI are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to develop substitutes that will be less harmful to the ozone layer. The hope is that in years to come, the substitutes will not turn out to be just as harmful in other ways that scientists cannot now foresee. Tom Fenton, CBS News, London. 
There was another explosion of anti-Chinese violence in Tibet today. China's news agency says 10 demonstrators and a policeman were killed in a clash with Tibetan separatists who rioted in the capital of Lhasa. The agency says the protest started as an illegal parade by Buddhist monks demanding independence for Tibet. Coming up next on the CBS Evening News, John Tower staying in the fight. And later on Inside Sunday, ethics and teaching the right stuff. A Los Angeles Times poll released today finds less than half the public supports John Tower for defense secretary. And two out of three people said they believed he could not keep his pledge to stay off the bottle if confirmed. But the nominee is still insisting he will not withdraw. Jacqueline Adams reports. Again today, John Tower came out swinging, ignoring the polls, refusing to withdraw his nomination, accusing the Senate of hypocrisy and his opponents of playing politics. Uh, perhaps John Tower is not really the issue. John Tower was, uh, was, was simply the instrument by which the president was defeated on a major, major decision. And I'm amazed that, uh, that there's been no question of political motive here, that, uh, that this is viewed as some sort of an objective process of evaluating the nominee's personal behavior, when in fact, there's more than a modicum of politics in this. Politics aside, Tower again tried to answer his critics directly, vowing he won't drink if confirmed. I'm accustomed now to 24-hour sobriety, and I think uh, that speaks for itself. My pledge I will honor, just as I honor my pledge to defend the Constitution of the United States. But his bitterness undisguised, the embattled nominee lashed out at critics of his defense contractor lobbying. I never transmitted any classified information to any unauthorized recipient. I deny that. There's no proof of it. There's not even a suggestion of it. Democrats remained unconvinced and urged both Tower and the president to end the divisive debate now. You ought not to be representing clients who are dealing with the defense industry right on the foot of coming off on, on, on coming out of strategic arms talks and then going back to those talks after you're out still called an ambassador and representing these people to me that's wrong now maybe somebody says it's just an appearance i think it's a real mistake they evidently want confrontation and unfortunately because of their position that's what they're going to get Yet even some Republicans sense the end uh, the is near. We'd like to see him confirmed. If we can't confirm him, at least we're going to correct the record and do justice to him. The debate is expected to go on for days yet, and the White House is determined to play it out till the bitter end, to make them pay, in the words of one advisor, even if it means diverting attention away from the rest of the president's agenda. Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, the White House. A senior U.S. official said in Vienna today that there are no intentions of calling off the dialogue with the PLO, but he said concerns remain about guerrilla raids against Israel. Secretary of State Baker is in Vienna for conventional arms talks later this week. More from State Department correspondent Bill Plant. Tanks, planes, and guns. How many weapons do the U.S., the Soviets, and their allies need to keep the military balance in Europe? Secretary of State James Baker arrived here for new talks on that old question this week. He'll also have his first official meeting with Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadzer. With the NATO allies on record believing that Soviet leader Gorbachev has dominated the public relations offensive with his offers of unilateral disarmament, the stakes are high. You've got a building set of pressures in the West, economic, demographic, psychological, all of which are indicating people would like to get out from under what we've been doing for 40 years. It seems to me this is a good, good opportunity to start working on that. Secretary Baker began by meeting with his counterparts from Poland and Hungary, courting Moscow's allies. Aides later praised the moves which both nations are making toward political and economic openness. In the talks on conventional weapons, which open later in the week, the U.S. maintains that the East has an overwhelming edge, over two to one in tank forces, for example. The Soviets don't deny that, but claim that their weapons are offset by NATO's air and naval forces so that both sides have rough equality. After 15 years of talks which have gone nowhere, there's a belief that a reduction of conventional weapons is now around the corner because the Soviets find it in their interest to do so. 
What worries many in the administration and in the alliance is that progress in these talks could just lead to more pressure on NATO for reductions and negotiations on its short-range nuclear missiles. And that's leverage the U.S. doesn't want to give up. Bill Plant, CBS News, Vienna. In Tokyo, two right-wing extremists crashed a truck loaded with gasoline containers into a wall outside the home of Prime Minister Takeshita. Both were arrested. The gasoline didn't ignite. There were no injuries. A radical PLO leader vowed today to kill Salman Rushdie. Syrian-based Ahmed Jabril said Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, defames Islam. Meanwhile, police in Ravenna, Italy today were ordered to guard the tomb of Dante Alighieri after Muslim extremists threatened to blow it up. The Muslims asked the mayor to declare that Dante, who wrote in the 14th century, lied when he described Muhammad in the Divine Comedy as a traitor relegated to hell. since that infamous apple incident in the Garden of Eden, man has been debating matters of right and wrong. Tonight on Inside Sunday, ethics, still in the headlines, again the subject of heated debate, most notably in the Tower nomination fight. We're going to look at ethics in government, on the job, and in the classroom, and we begin with the latest attempt to set standards for public officials. George Bush was in office just five days before, with some fanfare, he announced a new commission to rewrite the book on government ethics. We need an unambiguous code, a code of conduct. Sound vaguely familiar? Ridding this government of the incompetent, the dishonest... Concern over ethics in Washington comes and goes, and it's come again to a public disillusion with the standards of its officials. Over the years, definitions of what's okay and what's not have changed. Eisenhower wanted to be rid of outright scoundrels. Publicly, Johnson ruled out even the appearance of wrongdoing. The Reagan administration took a much less restrictive view. They really tried to do away with the notion that any standards mattered except criminal conduct. So he was part of that administration where special prosecutors always seem to be investigating someone. President Bush says that now that he's in charge, there are higher standards, and even some past critics accept it. When things get so bad, that's your best opportunity to clean it up, to make progress. That's the kind of period we're in now. Others argue that all this ethics talk is merely a diversion, a way to avoid tough problems like drugs, homelessness, and poverty. It allows uh, the leadership of the Republican Party to sound uh, moral without confronting the sen some of the central moral dilemmas of the society. Ironically, so far, the new ethics has caused Bush appointees nothing but trouble. He wants to have an appearance standard, but he puts people in office who themselves have an appearance issue. Cases in point. Secretary of State James Baker forced to sell off his bank stock, something he first said he'd never do. White House counsel Boyd and Gray, the president's man on ethics, compelled to distance himself from his family's business. HHS Secretary Lewis Sullivan made to give up half a million dollars in severance pay he wanted to keep. It's going to take some time before we really know whether we're moving in Washington from a period of no expectation ethics to a period of high expectation ethics. Whether all this new commitment really will change things, public concern about ethics is clearly in. We're now looking for people uh, who stand above the crowd, uh, who uh, don't seem to have their hand in the till, who uh, seem to be serving those old values which have been so much talked about. As some of the Bush appointees found out, complying with ethical standards can be an expensive proposition. Now, making sure someone else complies, that can be even more costly. Gary Reeves has the story of a man who blew the whistle and his own career. Listen to that wind. While many people think the whistleblower is an American hero, Mike Thompson oh, sure doesn't man. feel like one. I'll be glad when spring gets here. He's been broke and unemployed ever since he went public with claims that the builders of the Army's high-tech replacement for the Jeep, the Hummer, ordered employees to fake records claiming its wheels were properly aligned. I lost my job. Thompson and defense contractor LTV are locked in a legal battle over his allegations, which the company denies. But now he's known as a troublemaker, a label that makes it hard for him to find work and even harder for his family. 
they see that since I told the truth, I haven't gained anything by telling the truth. I've, I've lost everything. I've lost my home. I've lost my friends. Thompson's troubles are not unusual. One study says 17% of whistleblowers lose their homes, 15% get divorced, and 10% attempt suicide. It's comparable, I think, to the death of a spouse or the death of a child in terms of the stress level that it causes on a person. Psychologist Don Sokin says whistleblowers are rarely prepared for the stress or for the disappointment that comes from learning that telling the truth can make things worse instead of better. They can't understand how they could, this could possibly happen to somebody who's been doing the right thing. That's why Sokin formed the Whistleblowers Assistance Fund and opened the Whistle Stop, a West Virginia retreat they can use while they rebuild their lives. It's been a lifesaver for Mike Thompson. Somebody has to stand up. Somebody has to take a stand. Where would we be with, uh, with the Constitution if somebody didn't take a stand? This week, Congress begins hearings on a new proposal to protect whistleblowers from firings and harassment. The last such bill passed Congress unanimously, but was vetoed by President Reagan. Whistleblowers are the Achilles heel of bureaucratic corruption. Uh, they're the human factor. It sounds the alarm when the, the powers that be get out of control. It's beautiful, isn't it? Even though support for whistleblowers is growing, Agencies that counsel them still say the smartest ones are like Watergate's deep throat, eternally anonymous. Gary Reeves, CBS News, New York. Now a question, can ethics be taught? We'll try to answer that in just a moment when Inside Sunday continues on the CBS Evening News. system in this country insists that schools must get back to teaching the basics. That usually means the three R's. Well, David Culhane takes us now to a New York City school that has added two more, right and wrong. Right, and I think that's what we have to deal with. The rest of us should learn a lesson from that. Um, the class is called Respect, Care, and Share. It's at Theodore Roosevelt High School in the Bronx, a community plagued with crime and drugs. Hardly the place you would expect a course on ethics. But that's just what it is. Miss Warren is bringing Corin, Derek, and Eric before the committee for disruption in community. We vote the program is part of a national trend to get high schools from New York to California involved in teaching fundamental values. What we fail to emphasize is the moral inadequacies in the society as a whole the scandals in Wall Street, the scandals in the White House. Since its inception four years ago, the course has become more and more popular. Right now, there are 95 students at Roosevelt in the program, and they think the need is urgent. This program would help some of these students grow and actually become better persons, better people. Some critics, concerned about separation of church and state, have expressed reservations about the teaching of ethics in public schools because moral values are so often associated with religious values. So the teachers focus on broad societal values and avoid questions involving religious differences. We get the kids to see that there is a right and wrong, and more important than that, the reasons for doing right. And educators are discovering that there are shared basic principles in our society. We have to have certain basic uh, moral principles that we all adhere to, otherwise we'll turn into uh, a jungle. So what punishment are we going to give them if we're going to give them any punishments? Marisol Allers, who hopes someday to be a lawyer, is running the weekly meeting of the Fairness Committee, a part of the program designed to get students involved in judging conduct in the school. He was in the wrong for getting up and going and speaking to um, Douglas. It seemed like you just want to send him to jail because something's so small. The program has reaffirmed some basic values and at the same time taught the students new ways of thinking. I understand what you're trying to say. Everything has two sides and you'll learn to look at it that way. No one believes the high school ethics courses by themselves will solve the problem of moral values in the society. But they are a start. David Culhane, CBS News, New York. 
One final note on ethics, that presidential commission drawing up new standards for ethics in government is now working on its final report and hopes to deliver it to the White House later this week. Most of the recommendations will need the approval of both the president and Congress. Of late word in that the machinist union has just announced it has called off plans to stage sympathy strikes at many of the nation's commuter railroads the machinist officials say that they will not set up picket lines at any rail carrier's property at this time the, this was earthquake weekend in the west a moderate quake rocked grand canyon national park in arizona this morning an aftershock of a saturday earth rocker and a light earthquake hit northwest of seattle last night no injuries or damage reported anywhere much of the South got a reminder today of just what season this still is. Jonathan Sanders has our report. The Sun Belt may be ready for spring, but deep in the heart of Texas, old man winter won't go away. A late winter storm rumbled across the Plain states, bringing as much as 14 inches of snow. Few vehicles ventured out, and even emergency workers had trouble dealing with the icy road conditions. It's real bad. Like I say, it's a... Uh... It makes the firefighting a lot tougher. American Airlines was forced to cancel 200 flights at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, leaving travelers trying to make new arrangements for the transportation system already crippled by the Eastern Airlines strike. The storm also slowed air traffic in Oklahoma and filled the bus terminal with stranded passengers. A tractor trailer overturned, blocking traffic on a key highway. In Dallas, the roads and the churches were virtually empty. Well, it affected it drastically where we normally would have uh, 15, 16, 1700 folks. Uh, today we've probably got 60 or 70. The temperature plunged to a record low in Dallas. But as usual, there were those who found beauty in the cold. Just uh, rarely get an opportunity to see Dallas on ice. With spring just two weeks away, Texans were getting ready for baseball and blue bonnet season. Instead, they got an unexpected chance to play in the snow. Jonathan Sanders, CBS News, New York. That is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather will be here tomorrow and later on tonight, John Ferrugia with the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Susan Spencer, and I'll see you next week. This is CBS.